Tim, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Matthew. Great to see you. Why don't we start with your background, you know, where you got started, sort of the arc of your career, and then what you're doing now. Yeah, thanks. So I had two left turns, I say, in my career. The first one was uh, when I was sitting in a um, little uh, cubicle writing uh, MATLAB code as an engineer uh, in my university, and I had a trusted friend and mentor come by. He, he was one of the members of faculty and uh, said, hey, can I grab your CV and I want to send it somewhere? And I said, sure, here, here it is. Like, oh, by the way, where are you sending it to? And he said, well, I can't tell you. So it was like really all of a sudden very spooky. And it turns out that he, this is back in the year 2000, he sent it up to uh, what then, uh, well, it is still the, the National Security Agency and uh, which was uh, doing a massive hiring campaign. Um, in the early 2000s because of the you know, post-Cold War and peace dividend and so on at the time. So I arrived at uh, NSA just several weeks, I would say before 9-11 and uh, had a, 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 you know, the transformative event happen there. I worked a lot in research and biometrics. I did a lot in quantum information sciences like quantum computing and cryptography, did a lot in big data analysis or uh, you know, th that, that kind of thing as well as cyber related issues. So um, it was a great career, but uh, my second left turn then was when I had a mentor who had actually himself been a staffer in Congress and had worked for the House Intelligence Committee. And he mentored me at lunch one time and said, you know, or he suggested, would you consider working for the Congress? And I, frankly, I hadn't done that at all. I didn't think Congress would be interested in a scientist and engineer, but uh, I was wrong. And I was able to Right around that time, uh, the, the job for the chief scientist was posted at GAO, which is the, for any of your listeners that don't know, we're the largest uh, legislative branch agency in the US government and uh, did with over, on the order of 33 to 3400 FTE. And we do a lot, a lot of the oversight work. We're called the Congressional Watchdog. And we work for uh, a broad array of, of, of issues and committees and entities of the Congress. And so it's been a great thing starting off from a, a, a MATLAB coding engineer into a advanced research uh, leader and director, and then into then a science and tech policy space. So that's sort of the, the, the short form of, of my, my background. Excellent. And so at the GAO, can you talk about sort of what your group or what you do uh, and how long have you been in that role and, and sort of how does it really interact with the day-to-day -day of Congress? Yeah, thanks. So I, I became the chief scientist at GAO in 2008. Um, and then um, at the time I had a small, relatively modest group of, of science engineer folks doing science and engineering work. Uh, a lot of what we do in our over supporting congressional oversight is heavily technical. It could be life sciences related work, like what we did in anthrax uh, analysis and so on. Remember the anthrax attacks in October of 01, over to dealing with weapon systems or dealing with environmental issues and climate change and so on. So I uh, had a small group, but over time then, within the last uh, or two and a half years ago, um, Congress and then the Comptroller General, my, my boss, uh, stood up a team called the Science Tech Assessment and Analytics Team. And, that name is important because the TA is our middle name in S2AA, and that's, that's the tech assessment mission that used to be done by the former Office of Technology Assessment, uh, which lived uh, between 1972 and 1995, uh, when it was defunded in the 104th Congress. So that mission has come to GAO. I've built out that capacity. Our team now is approximately uh, around 110 folks. Um, and if you're benchmarking the OTA, OTA was about 143, to be precise. Um, but we're on our way to uh, honor around that number to do that. But secondly, I'd say what is different is that we are the A and SDAA, the second A, is analytics. And so we're doing a lot with data now. And uh, when you really think about uh, the needs for Congress and what GAO does for Congress, we really do uh, essentially use data uh, as part of analysis to convert questions into answers. And usually the questions are oversight related. You know, why is this program, uh, you know, X number of times its original budget request? That's a typical thing. Or why is this, this program not working or what have you? Um, but our job is to do, um, to provide that oversight uh, that, that, that supports Congress and, 
and 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 particularly in their in their Article One mission. So it's a very important job, and I'm I'm glad that we have a team now with with many more science and engineering types to help Congress at this time. So can you talk a little bit about you know the way it works in terms of which deliverables you kind of are presenting to the Congress and and who are your customers? I know that the GAO really only works with committees. Um, so, you know, how do you, are there, are, do you have like standard deliverables that you're putting out every month or quarter, or are you all, are you responding only to requests? You know, can you talk through that process a little bit? Yes, yeah, sure. Absolutely. So we, it, it, most of our work is, Matthew, as you said, is for, for the committee at the committee level. However, we can and do, uh, off, we, we do do work for individual members when it's, it's possible. Uh, one of the challenges is always that we have more requests for work than our capacity to deliver on it. So there is a, a priority and a protocol system that was developed years ago and with the prior or the previous controller general, we, we, it's written and it's published. So uh, members, even if you're a new member, you can, uh, and, and GAO actually helps out, says here's how you might ask for something like that. But generally, yes, it's committee's jurisdiction, certainly for the leadership. If, if congressional leadership needs something, then we, we work for them. Uh, so we start work under three different modes. The first and strongest is the mandate. It's when you know, you'll often see bills that become a law, they're passed, and it'll say from 60, 90, 120, 180 days of enactment of this bill, GAO shall uh, and do X, Y, Z underneath. So that's the mandate. Uh, that's about 10% of our work. Um, on the, um, the majority of our work though is, Matthew just said, the, the right word is request. And typically it's committees requesting because, uh, you know, in the, in, I think in the constitutional structure of, of the Congress and how it's, it's, it was founded and, and, and has worked for, uh, you know, we're now measuring in centennial timescales. It's been at the committee level where a lot of, a lot of things happen, even though, again, there's, you know, 435 opinions on the House side and 100 on the Senate, but somehow there has to be a convening and you have chair and ranking structures and so on. So uh, that's the committee request and we do most of our work, I would say 85% of that. And then there's a last, a little, uh, a tiny wedge of work that just often is just used um, by the Comptroller General, meaning uh, the, the CG is allowed to, or has the authority just to start work because he thinks it's important to do that. And oftentimes what happens is even committees with relatively broad jurisdictions, some of our challenges, Matthew, as you're well aware of, are so systems oriented or they're so broad, they don't fit neatly even into one committee. And so at times what happens is we need to um, initiate work uh, by the CG so that multiple committees can then come on afterward and the work isn't constrained or narrow down just to through a jurisdictional lens only. So think of artificial intelligence, for example, we're, we're about to put out what, what I think is gonna be one of STAA's most um, uh, important reports this year, which is a artificial intelligence um, accountability framework, right? So uh, the, the reality is as an engineer, I'll just tell you, AI is fundamentally the same technology everywhere right, on our, our home devices and so on, the way it's doing statistical computing, machine learning is fundamentally the same um, uh, on that, but it's different in it, it, where it's, uh, the differences matter greatly is, is in the contextual relevance of things, right? AI driving us around in a vehicle is a safety of life risk, and it's still machine learning system that we have to think about managing risk along that, which is different than, let's say, AI being used in, uh, in the criminal justice system where it's going to say, well, in the past judge such and so, this is something that's come up in case law and I'm just showing you something. It's not gonna make decisions or make uh, judgments, but that's a different risk. That's a justice risk and making sure that things, for example, are compliant with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So the CG can, can, can do that. Where our work comes out is uh, we uh, do deliver these, these things, um, uh, in, in, in whatever time when we can deliver them. If they're, if Congress asks for a lot in a study, then it's gonna take a little bit longer. So it's not like a dedicated reporting thing just for our team. Although the, although the Comptroller General has hearings every year as part of our budget process, we still go through an authorizing and appropriations 
uh, process like other federal agencies just to say, here's what we're doing, what we have done and so on. So there's a, an annual report there, but there's also the way we deliver, uh, we really think now increasingly in terms of a content-centered approach versus a report. What we want is our science and tech insight uh, and even foresight, especially the foresight part with a lot of things in the shocks coming in, we want to get that out in all the digital channels and media and things available today and not just have something that we would call shelfware, where it's a, a nice thick thing, but it just resides on the shelf and nobody consumes that. So and that's oh, interesting. So you're delivering, yeah. you know, not just paper, but, you know, you're finding new forms, new channels, new, new media to deliver the information. New media, and the, and the main word is, I like the word that uh, this was derived by a study committee of the National Academy of Public Administration. They did a report about, in our case, it was relevant to us because it was dealing with science and tech capacity for Congress. And so we are part of that equation. We're not the only science and tech player in the congressional universe, but arguably we're the biggest currently. Uh, we, our sister agency, CRS, has good science group and they do things there. CBO may touch upon a little bit of science uh, here and there. And of course you have congressional fellows that have science backgrounds and so on. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, with that, we, we are able to uh, uh, deliver a lot of content. We're thinking much more in the content. And the word that I wanted to say is absorptive. That's the NAPA word. It's really not just about you know, pushing more information. And Congress gets information pushed to that arguably uh, it's, it's the most advised body in the world. The issue is how does it find, is, does it filter and select and do triage on that information to find the good so that it can understand and absorb what are the key issues, what's known, what's not known, what's the, the upside, what's the downside of various things. And that's really a lot of what we're about. So th that's the, the kind of the medium through which you're communicating the information. So what about the information itself? What exactly are you helping Congress to do? Is it, you know, help them understand the, you know, how technology has evolved in the past or what the current state of play is or how things, you know, models of the future, is it facts, is it opinions? You know, what are the, what's really what you're ultimately communicating? Sure, no, great question. Uh, ultimately, we're, I mean, institutionally, our science and tech fits under this is we're a nonpartisan fact-based non-ideological reporting mechanism to the Congress uh, now to help them primarily with oversight, but we do a lot of foresight. So uh, my passion is particularly focused on the foresight piece, which is trying to um, anticipate trends in science and tech and major events that will be or to a lawmaker or a committee might be a shock to them in terms of what does this mean? How do we have to face the issues and try and arrive there before they do so that we can at least have a, a sense, I think of it as a, like a reconnaissance, right? I'm just scaling out the land and I'm gonna report to uh, headquarters and say, here's what's coming. Right as, as you move down the road, and this is how you might want to think about uh, adjusting. Or here are some implications that you know you may not know it yet, but you're going to have to legislate on this, or you may have to tweak this, or update this, or what have you. So, for us, the ideal space is to be just out uh, out front enough. I'm not talking about 30 years. I'm talking about five or something, and say this is what this is going to mean. And uh, these are the things that are come that are going to come before you, and we are here to help. You know, we're not we're not making recommendations about what you should do. You're elected by the voters. You have your mind in terms of those particular things, but we will tell you the framework around which uh, you know the policy framework that that uh, is is going to um, have to be considered based upon or given these particular um, advancements, be it you know, 5G or AI or CRISPR gene editing, whatever it is, uh, is to try and uh, set that up for them. And then be there along their side if they had like, explain this to me, what does this mean? I don't understand that. To be their agents working for them versus the external voices, which oftentimes are, have their own agenda, which is what Congress is there to do, is to be lobbied, to be doing whatever. Our job is not to be lobbying, to be on their side. So it sounds like this kind of, um, I guess, foresight piece re requires a couple of different elements. One is facts about what's happening now or has right. happened in the past. And then when you go into this future mode, 
uh, you need to have a kind of a model of the future and make assumptions about the future. Um, now, how do you come up with those? Those are, you know, obviously that's a, it's a fraud exercise by hedge funds, by, uh, sure. by, right. by policymakers and by, you know, everyone who has to, you know, travel somewhere, you know, there's this kind of a future assumptions. How do you approach that, those kind of critical questions about what assumptions to make and how do you build your kind of model of the future? Yeah, great question. And this is actually part of the, the, the art uh, as much as science of uh, doing foresight things is really scenario-based work. And so uh, a number of our tech assessments, uh, I think one of the big ones we really tested this out, it's, it's very much a, um, a prominent feature of, of, of the work we did was in climate engineering or what's called geoengineering. So this was the whole issue of how do we, how do we think big thoughts about potential, if we, if we take the fact that we have disfavorably, we have an anthropogenic signal, right? The, the man-made signal somehow from the CO2 emissions into the earth system. And we've unintended and in an unintended manner, nonetheless, we've, we've introduced that signal and it portends challenges for us. How do we think about remove, reducing or even removing or, or counteracting that signal? So that is a massive issue because you're talking about earth system science and things like that. but. Matthew, what was exciting about it in the foresight area was telling the story about what if we did nothing? What if we just accepted the status quo? How do we think it's going to go along and kind of the, can we just muddle through? Sometimes, by the way, doing nothing is the right thing, right? Having a positive action uh, assumption can be also challenging because just, just do something can be dangerous or worse than your current condition. But we also then uh, looked at things to say, well, what if we supported, what if the government did this level of work in climate engineering or that particular issue or tested and did research and, and you know, we only have one uh, climate, global climate ecosystem. We cannot test and, and create a new laboratory to do that. So it's extremely high risk. Um, but what it allowed us to do is to set, set the technology, right? It could have been direct air capture carbon dioxide system, which was part of this, this work, it could be uh, what's called so solar radiation management, or where if you could imagine trying to increase um, the albedo of the clouds, or you you artificially generate enough cloud cover to reduce the amount of energy absorbed, solar energy absorbed on the Earth's surface, or the waters, or what have you. Uh, you could have these sort of things, but tell a story with them, and and this is a story that's based. It's a science fiction prototype is the way to think about it, but based upon science facts, like here is what you know. And so telling it the story, it's not strictly about the technology. The technology is a key actor in the story, but it's not just about that. It's putting it in there because when you walk through the story in the scenario, that's where the policy things and the implications come out right? If this, what would that mean for that? And that's where it's, it's a nice laboratory, Matthew, for doing this sort of, um, I guess, like you're saying, I imagine hedge funds doing the same kind of thing or what, you know, investors saying, what if this, and here's a, a projection, and then you have to make educated uh, bets, essentially, on what you think is going to be there, what's more likely, and so on. And so when you, pr you know, you provide this, this information, it sounds to me similar to like what Kevin Esterling we interviewed in the past called a causal chain, you're, you're laying out a kind of causal chain uh, yes. in your report and then giving options or different scenarios about where the interventions could potentially right. be. Is that is that the approach? Yes, and part of it is just, you you really are asking the, the national decision maker and, th and things, you're saying, what is the future that you would like and how do we shape it in such a way? And what are the pl plausible scenarios to get there? Uh, I'll just say, you know, scientists and engineers don't like to use infinitives a lot, but this is an easy one to use, which is that uh, technologies always, without exception, always ha have a double-edged sword narrative, right? I mean, we, uh, in the technologies are agnostic. They don't care about our sovereign borders. They don't care about our political uh, parties or, you know, uh, various personal agendas. They are what they are. They can be used for good. They can be used for ill. Um, how do we maximize the upsides and minimize the downsides? And that's where, again, walking through, telling these stories, doing that causal chain, like you're saying, in a foresight context and teasing out the policy implications and saying what we want is this, but we don't want that. How do we, 
How do we do that? And yet still recognize there's not going to be any perfect world with zero risk anywhere. So that's that's totally the thought. It's the interesting thought. you mentioned unintended consequences because you know I think that's one area where it's really difficult to get your head around, particularly in policy where there's always unintended consequences, right? Everything you right. do, you never want to tell the story about unintended consequences, but they're inevitable with every piece of policy. Is that another thing that you do as you think through what some of those unintended consequences could be from a technological lens? Yes, and technological and from scenario-based building, those, those are the, the kind of things to say. This is what this, this could, may, might mean to, or sometimes if you, if you, ha you have no doubt, it, this will mean this, you will have to change that or have to think about how to do that given that. So yes, it's absolutely what you say. Great, so what you just described, this kind of future uh, thinking, sounds to me very kind of high level. Um, it's kind of like a backdrop or like a climate in which the Congress is working and thinking, right? And, and altering their kind of right. their future models of the world really and giving them some kind of heads up about the way things could go in different scenarios. And you know, one other aspect that I think that, and that's kind of a very top down way of, of engaging the Congress, right? And, and the other way right. I think is because Congress is a, is a bill to law process, right? Uh, right? And ultimately it's every bill that needs to make its way through the system, be modified and then turns into law. And, you know, the, the CBO has its, has its, its process embedded into that process, right? Through the scoring mechanism. Um, now, is that something that your team could ultimately do is look on a bill by bill basis, get into that bill to law process so that it's not just kind of a high level, uh, you know, projection, but it's, you know, looking at a bill by bill and thinking through some of those unintended consequences or what the impact might be on that causal chain. Absolutely. So we could, I would say, um, I, I'm, I'm not saying that we're seeking to do that. That could be a very large lift, by the way, with the number of bills. You know, again, I'm not excusing myself. I'm just saying that's, that's definitely one of those easy to say uh, versus do. I will say when committees or members and offices have reached out, they've asked us, they've inserted us in their process to say, hey, will you just have a look at this if we become from a science and tech perspective, you know, they're asking, does this make sense? Do you see any issues here? And it's not only my scientists and engineers on, on the team, we have very good attorneys uh, in my agency that, that come along, you know, this is about law. So it's great to bring in our, you know, legally trained professionals who are very good at a number of things like appropriations law or other issues uh, to be able to do that. So yes, we, I, it, I wouldn't say we're able to, from a tech perspective, it sounds intriguing. Like, could we, do a tech scoring like CBO does budget scoring. I think there's a, a kind of that that could be done. Uh, I think it's just having uh, a best effort, best look in the time allowed uh, feedback on, hey, you may wanna consider this in the process. And that's if Congress wanted to, to do that. So part of it is, would be on us to deliver that, but also would be, um, I guess, making it known to Congress that they, that we exist, that we could help them if they wanted to, to work with us in that mode. Uh, at GAO, we just call it technical assistance. They're just calling us and saying, hey, Tim, what do you, you know, it's not just me, but you know, what do you all think about this? What's, I'm, I'm thinking about such and so, let's say small modular nuclear reactors, right? What are the issues with that? Well, okay, there's a, uh, you know, a, a uh, a regulatory issue with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. There's research and development issues that Department of Energy is seeing. Here's the marketplace. Here's what's expected. You know, we can give some insight. Uh, I wouldn't say it's scoring to say, yes, I would do this or no, I wouldn't. But I would say, you know, this is what this is going to mean. And this could be a significant, present a significant cost or risk in some way. So it could be done, but uh, it's not a formal thing in, in an ongoing way. It's, it's an as or on request, on demand thing. Right, you know, I think the um, the OTA, you know, as you said, was defunded at one point, um, uh, which a lot of people regret. You know, we've had had several people on the program in the past, Tony Mills, uh, Zach Graves, who have talked quite a bit about OTA, and I wonder, you know, if to make the institution as long term as possible, right, and to get that thinking embedded into the process of Congress, uh, it might be you know, ultimately a good thing for Congress to put this kind of scoring mechanism into the bill 
itself uh, in the same way that uh, the CBO does if, if to make it a, an institutional kind of uh, change for Congress. And I wonder how it would be structured ultimately if you, if you scored a bill, you know, what are the things, what are the kind of values that you could bring on a bill to bill basis? You know, we talked about this idea of unintended consequences, I think would be a very fascinating one. Sure. You, know, you look at a bill and say, what conse or consequences unintended intended or not would that have on the, on, on the United States from a technology point of view? You know, what other, what other ways do you think you could input on a bill? What would be the, the kinds of informational value you could do at that granular level? Well, right, we are trying uh, to, in that proactive space on things to, let's say we're talking about uh, some advanced technologies where, like I said, if we can try and set up camp as it were beforehand and, and be there, then we can, we can help, you know, generally, you know, like the tide raises all boats, just raise awareness, raise the issues um, and, and we can do this and have done this in a nonpartisan way. Um, we are, because of the growth of our team, we're still growing and getting up there. Um, our, if you want to think of us as rate of production, I don't think about report count as, as necessarily our metric. I think about whatever we produce, how is it absorbed and what is it, what is its impact? That's what really our metrics we're trying to go toward. Um, but I think if we if we can get there and be there out in front, I think we could do a lot of what you're suggesting and, and try and achieve some of those things that OTA did have some uh, key successes in doing that. It's not just writing a 100 page report or more. Yes, you need to build that knowledge, but really have that proactive knowledge base built, be there for question and answer, as well as say, you know what, we're not trying to be pushy here. We're trying to just let us put forward like you haven't asked about this. Here are some things you need to think about. We're doing that now. We we have uh, Matthew, one of our, our an exciting um, uh, advancement we made in recent uh, since our inception as a team is the an S and T Spotlight series, which is just two page explainers of science and technology across anything you can imagine. We've done things on hypersonics because that's a big concern in DoD, uh, even though it has a civil airspace interest on that. What you know, you see the uh, United, I think it was the airlines was going to get, we're going to get back into the, you know, uh, a high speed supersonic at least area, but uh, to, to get to New York and London in two and a half hours. But um, I, I'm saying we have things like that. We have 5G, we have blockchain, we have um, uh, genomic sequencing in the pan. We've done so many things in the pandemic. These are just important because as our, we're trying to act in a, it's an agile operational tempo to give them information right away as a down payment. And if they're interested to say, yeah, I'm really, that's in my interest area, or hey, you're right because you've, you've identified some key potential implications. I want you to do a bigger study on that. And so we can, again, be a bit more proactive and operate more on a clock speed of the 21st century uh, tempo that Frank and Congress is facing.